Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us and welcome to our webinar on the exciting subject of compulsory purchase orders. It is designed to be digestible to those new to the subject uh, and to include insights and perspectives which will prove useful even to seasoned practitioners. Let's see how we go. Emmeline Lambert and I will start by leading you through the life of the CPO from uh, its notional birth all the way to, well, redundancy, I suppose. Uh, we're not gonna kill any CPOs off, uh, identifying some of the ups and downs on the way. Then Christina Lienen will consider the CPO powers most frequently used in practice uh, before Paul Shadarivian QC will discuss the scheme and its importance. We hope you are comfortable that the connection is good in every sense and that you have a cup of whatever you tend to enjoy at about this time of day. Feel free to make use of the Q&A function. Uh, we do hope to answer questions in writing as we go. Uh, personally, I doubt that I'll manage that, but uh, let's see. And, uh, and certainly at the end, there'll be a, a, a question and answer session uh, the length of which will depend on the number of questions and the time we've got available, obviously. The slides that we're going to take you through will be available on our website in the next day or two. And as I'm sure you've been um, informed by the software, we are being recorded. Uh, and so you'll be able to look at this again uh, if you'd like to. So uh, without more ado uh, and to get started, uh, I'm going to say something about procedure before I hand over to, uh, to Emily. Have a look at this slide, which sums up everything, really, that Emily and I are going to uh, impress on you. You will see that the essence of CPO law and practice is actually quite simple. There are two pillars, uh, those two bullets shown on the slide. Uh, the two essential principles, I would say, uh, one of substance and one of procedure that we're going to seek to impress on you. There must always be a compelling case in the public interest. Uh, and this is so important a requirement that it effectively summarises government policy on confirmation of CPOs. And bearing in mind that but these orders are effectively removing property rights by force. The procedural safeguards uh, that are set by statute and by regulation uh, must be adhered to very closely. If those two principles are, are uh, followed uh, and if both are achieved, an acquiring authority ought to succeed. This second slide is really just a list of references for future reference. Uh, you'll see that the main statutory source for, from the point of view of procedure for these uh, kinds of CPOs is the Acquisition of Land Act, which applies both in England and Wales. But at the level of regulations, there's some divergence. Principles are very, very similar, but at different sources. And similarly, the guidance. Principles, very similar but those two different sources. And without more ado, here is Emmeline Lambert. Thank you for that introduction, Harriet, and good morning, everyone. Um, first slide, please. That's me, isn't it? <laughs> Before we look at the procedure in detail, it's worth noting some facts to provide some con context. Firstly, most CPOs, even those resisted at inquiry, are actually confirmed. Now, unfortunately, there is no central database of decisions, so it's not very easy to get up to date statistics. But Womble Bond Dickinson produced a report in 2017 relating to CPOs in 2015 and 2016. I know there are some attendees from Womble Bond Dickinson, so thank you. And from it, we know the following. 
94% of planning CPOs were confirmed or withdrawn in 2015 and 81% in 2016. And in relation to housing CPOs, 93% confirmed or withdrawn in 2015 and 94% in 2016. And the time from submission to decision was mostly under one year. As a benchmark, the report notes that for unopposed housing CPOs, the time to confirmation is around two months. And for an unopposed planning CPO, the time to confirmation is about three months. The reasons for failure range, but the most frequent include circumstances or human rights of the objector, a proposed alternative scheme by the objector, or the quality of consideration by the authority. And as an example, there is the public sector equality duty. And the report notes that there is evidence of an increasingly detailed assessment being required by the individual circumstances of landowners and occupiers when weighing the proportionality of interference with their rights, including the application of the public sector equality duty. Harriet, next slide, please. The acquiring authority makes the CPO, submits it for confirmation, and if all goes well, the confirming authority ultimately confirms the CPO with or without modification. Sun Tzu, a sixth century Chinese general said, time spent in reconnaissance is seldom wasted. And this saying is particularly pertinent when it comes to preparing for a CPO because attention to procedural detail is essential and it falls to the acquiring authority. As Harriet said, it's because the confirming minister has to be satisfied that the statutory procedure has been followed correctly. And that's whether the CPO is opposed or not. And because of the nature of acquiring land belonging to another in this way, it's obvious that it must be checked that no one has been prejudiced. And for example, that the correct people have been served and that service has been properly affected. Next slide, please. So first of all, preparation. There is a lot to do in preparation and the essentials have been distilled into the bullet points on this slide. The second bullet point, before making the CPO, the acquiring authority should identify all those with qualifying interests. They need to ensure that they're all captured and if necessary, use statutory powers to obtain the necessary information. And I'll come back to those statutory powers shortly. The acquiring authority should also identify where known and where in the balance the human rights implications for those whose property rights will be interfered with. This comes back to the public sector equality duty and human rights considerations mentioned earlier. This requires consideration at the earliest stages, uh, but also on an ongoing basis. The third bullet point, before making the CPO, the acquiring authority should ensure it has an up-to-date and lawful authorization for the CPO actually made. Now, these powers are usually particular to a local authority's constitution. Usually cabinet approval is sufficient, but some constitutions might require full counsel. The fourth bullet point, the acquiring authority should know what land and or rights are needed to deliver the benefits of the scheme. What will be confirmed is only that which is necessary. For example, one objector may say that their plot is not needed to deliver the scheme, and it may be that a right of access is what is required rather than the land itself. Fifth bullet point, the CPO must be in the correct form, and this is all closely prescribed by the regulations set out in the earlier slide that Harriet showed. Next bullet point is that the CPO plan must be included at the correct scale and identify each plot clearly. The penultimate bullet point, the CPO must be made under seal, authenticated and dated, ideally on the same day. And then lastly, a statement of reasons, which must set out the essential case for acquisition and be served with the CPO. If this is going to be at all controversial, then review by external counsel is recommended. Guidance requires that the statement of reasons should be as comprehensive as possible. If there's any uncertainty as to the form or content of the CPO, seek external advice and or advice from the Ministry of Housing, Communities and Local Government. Um, they do actually offer to consider draft CPOs in their guidance. Tier 1 paragraph 24 says, 
Experience suggests that technical examination by the confirming department can assist significantly in avoiding delays caused by drafting defects in orders submitted for confirmation. The role of the confirming department at this stage is confined to giving the draft compulsory purchase order a technical examination to check that it complies with the requirements in form and content without prejudice to the consideration of merits and demerits. So whilst the role of the confirming department is limited, it could avoid issues further down the line. And it's worth noting at this point that whilst not strictly procedural, it is recommended that the acquiring authority takes other steps alongside this process, for example, undertaking negotiations in parallel and providing full information from the outset to those affected in order to reduce fear and anxiety. The negotiation should be proactive and in opposed cases, the Secretary of State will want to understand efforts that have been made. Next slide, please. The qualifying persons. Of particular importance is to identify within the CPO and notify all the qualifying persons. The definition is not as neat as might be hoped, but it is key because if someone is a relevant objector, they have the right to be heard. So who are they? They're on the next slide. All the following are qualifying persons uh, defined by section 12 of the Acquisition of Land Act 1981. So an owner, an occupier, a tenant. And then a person to whom the acquiring authority would be required to give notice to treat if proceeding under section 5.1 of the Compulsory Purchase Act 1965. So this is all persons interested in or having a power to sell and convey or release the land. And also a person the acquiring authority thinks is likely to be entitled to make a claim for compensation under section 10 of the Compulsory Purchase Act 1965. So compensation for injurious affection. If the order is confirmed and the compulsory purchase takes place, so far as he is known to the acquiring authority after making diligent inquiry. This relates mainly, but not exclusively to easements and restrictive covenants. In most cases, it's obvious who the interested persons are, but this final category is a catch-all that includes those not only whose land is taken, but those who are entitled to compensation under Section 10, even though land is not taken. The acquiring authority has information gathering powers, as I mentioned earlier, for example, Section 297 of the Highways Act 1980 and Section 5A of the Acquisition of Land Act 1981. And these can and should be used to ensure that everyone is captured who needs to be. And I'll now hand back to Harriet for confirmation. Thank you very much indeed, Emmeline. Um, and having made the perfect CPO, captured all the qualifying interests, what happens next? Well, uh, uh, when made by uh, a, a local authority, the uh, CPO needs to be submitted to the confirming authority, the Minister for Confirmation. So the very first step is to submit the necessary documents to that authority, uh, together with a certificate of compliance with the necessary procedural steps as to notice both in newspapers and to qualifying persons. Uh, note here the requirements of section six, quite unusual these days to have in primary legislation such detailed requirements as to the method of service on qualifying persons. Those notice requirements are absolutely essential and must be met to the letter. Therefore, proof of compliance should always be obtained. Uh, you never know who might crop up as an objector and say, actually, I was never served. The notice will spell out the period and form in which objections can be made. And that takes us to the next step in the process of confirmation, that of objection. The initial objection should be drafted with care. And in my view, uh, uh, with the benefit of specialist advice. Why do I say that? Well, formulating a strategy at an early stage enables an objector to frame their objection to the CPO 
in the most favorable way possible, bearing in mind that an initial document, uh, like the CPO for the acquiring authority, in fact, will remain in the public domain as they go through the objection process, including at inquiry. So the more articulate, the more relevant the objection is, the more the objector will attract the confidence of the inspector considering the objection and the more likely the objector is to be successful. But what approach is taken to uh, the points made in that objection uh, in part will depend on the objector's reason for objecting. It's, it's not possible in a uh, a situation like this to indicate a, a general um, set of points to take. Uh, common motives for objecting include an owner who's seeking to ensure compensation is acceptable, an owner seeking simply to delay or prevent acquisition altogether, an option holder wishing to develop the land for an alternative scheme, or perhaps a conservation group opposing the scheme altogether. It's well known that an objection can be disregarded, uh, that is a, a statutory um, uh, provision specifically allowing that it be disregarded, not taken into account, if it relates solely to compensation. But it is perfectly proper to oppose a, a compulsory purchase order on other grounds uh, not related to compensation, even if the motivation is to ensure that compensation is acceptable, even if the objector is prepared to accept uh, uh, an agreed sale, provided the price is right. Let's have a look at those objectors. Uh, in a compensation order case, all objectors are not equal. And we return in this slide to the importance of that phrase qualifying person and the point earlier made by Emmeline as to the rights and, uh, of the qualifying person. Uh, this slide needs some close attention because it's effectively defining some of the jargon that one sees in compulsory purchase cases and hopefully this slide will demystify some of that. Uh, the objection made by a qualifying person is a relevant objection and these objectors only have a right to be heard. Unless uh, the qualifying person agrees to the written representations procedure the CPO will be considered at inquiry. And unless that relevant objection, i.e. the objection by the qualifying person, is withdrawn or disregarded for relating solely to compensation, for example, it will become what's known as a remaining objection. Even if all remaining objections are withdrawn, while objections remain, the acquiring authority will need to convince the confirming authority of the compelling case for the compulsory purchase order. Uh, this, this happened to me uh, recently, uh, quite a simple uh, CPO of a former hotel uh, derelict. Uh, terms were agreed with the single owner uh, uh, in relation to the CPO, but there remained a, a couple of uh, objections from non-qualifying persons, interested persons living nearby that didn't like the scheme. And although the inquiry was cancelled, it was still necessary to make the case that a compelling case for, uh, uh, for purchase in the, in the, the compelling case in the public interest had been made out um, on paper uh, and in due course the compulsory purchase order was, was uh, confirmed. So a happy ending to that story. In, conf in confirming the CPO, there are a variety of procedures that may be followed, effectively five options listed on 
this slide, they're really just combinations of, of two variables, whether the uh, compulsory purchase order is going to be delegated, whether the confirmation, forgive me, is, is to be delegated to an inspector or decided by the minister, and whether the procedure is going to follow the written representations procedure or be determined at inquiry. And then in very limited circumstances, uh, the uh, confirmation may be returned to the acquiring authority. That's a discretionary power in the Secretary of State to return the confirmation to the acquiring authority, but the circumstances are limited. They're covered by the guidance at the paragraph on the slide. It's often noted uh, the uh, reference to the special parliamentary procedure that's required if the order includes certain what is defined as special kinds of land, that is land uh, forming part of a common open space or allotment. Uh, this is a much uh, less worrisome uh, procedure than you might think. Uh, it provides an additional safeguard for these special kinds of land, such that the order is laid before Parliament and considered by a committee of both houses if, and only if, a petition is lodged against confirmation of the order within 21 days. So something very much to bear in mind, but quite unusual for that special parliamentary procedure to actually have to be followed in terms of the laying of the order between uh, before those committees. So we've covered uh, submission, objection, and the procedure under which the order is considered for confirmation. What should happen meanwhile? As you can see on my to-do list, nothing is specifically ruled out, particularly uh, negotiation should uh, not pause, it should step up. The acquiring authority has a strong interest in securing agreement of all remaining objectors. You remember those are those objections by qualifying persons that have not been withdrawn, or at least as many as proves possible. And this often happens at inquiry. Also, meanwhile, each side is preparing its case and evidence uh, for the inquiry or, or through the written representations process. And the acquiring authority should certainly ensure that its evidence remains up to date to reflect perhaps changes in planning policy and particularly to ensure that the funding information that's put before the Secretary of State is up to date. Be aware that an inquiry uh, inspector is likely to be pretty tolerant, even if an objector produces a large amount of material evidence at the last minute. Such, I've been in inquiries where trolleys with boxes on them have appeared at the inquiry that have not been seen by the acquiring authority before. Uh, the the scales are tilted so far in favour of, uh, of the objector being given an opportunity to make their objection fully, that if an objector insists on that material going before the inquiry, th there will be a, a cooperation over uh, a, a procedural um, series of steps to ensure that it can be taken into account fairly. So there may be an adjournment, uh, there, may, there may be a way of dealing with those points in writing, there may be um, for further dispute over whether or not it's even relevant, but no inquiry is able to completely rule out the, um, the uh, admission of new evidence by an objector, even if it's in that form at the last minute something to be wary of. So um, the compelling case in the public interest, this key principle of securing confirmation of a compulsory purchase order, um, the, uh, 
this is my own summary um, uh, and I hope it's useful. It identifies some uh, headline points that under which you will want to uh, gather some evidence if making such a case. Uh, there is very, very helpful guidance in the um, in, in both the English and Wales Welsh versions and do follow that would be my recommendation. The most obvious point is show that the land and rights are required for a purpose within the scope of the relevant power, that they're needed in order that the purpose is achieved, that the scheme for which the land or rights are acquired is likely to be delivered. So what are the necessary statutory consents? Are they in place? or at least likely to be within a reasonable period, bearing in mind the uh, length of life of a CPO if it's, if it's to be implemented. And then finance, is it in place? Uh, if the scheme isn't viable in its own terms, where is the funding coming from? And that just flags up something that's often said by objectors, oh, but your scheme isn't viable. That doesn't matter so long as in terms of commercial viability. In fact, that may be why the CPO proves necessary, but is there public funding to bridge the gap? Uh, and finally, the harm associated with the proposed interference with the rights of those who currently own the land and rights that are being taken away. Uh, the interference with others affected by the CPO, is that outweighed by the public benefits of the scheme? A classic balance of, of, of cost and benefit, you may think. Uh, this is a summary of the inquiry procedure. Notice that the acquiring authority will lead, the onus is on them, their evidence goes first and is subject to cross-examination. That um, summary, I'm not, in the interest of time, I'm not going to read that out in detail. And then confirmation uh, by letter, similar to a planning appeal, and note the power to modify the order. Uh, this is, is one of the reasons it's so important to get the order right at the outset. It is used sparingly and cannot be used to add land. That's the third bullet on this slide. And note what's said about costs. Those who are successful generally recover their costs. And then I'm going to take this very quickly indeed. Uh, a um, slide on High Court challenge, uh, uh, basically a statutory judicial review under Section 23 of the Acquisition of Land Act. And implementation. Bear in mind that the CPO must be implemented within three years of the date it becomes operative. And I've identified the date it becomes operative. It is um, on the date notice of its confirmation is first published in accordance with section 15. And that um, uh, the implementation date um, becomes relevant as, uh, as it were, as your um, counterfactual, if you're trying to negotiate by agreement, because if negotiation fails, the valuation date will be fixed by statute. And I've set out in this slide how that is done. I am conscious I've probably overrun a little, and that's why I've taken these last slides quite quickly, but do ask any questions that arise in through the Q&A. And with that in mind, I'm going to hand over to Christina Lienen. Thank you very much. Thank you, Harriet. Um, I'm going to take everyone back straight to the beginning uh, for, for the consideration of what power we can actually use um, for a CPO. And the key message of my talk today is that in the context of CPOs, uh, authorities should use the most specific and appropriate power available. Now that of course begs the question, what are the specific powers that are available and how does one distinguish between them? Um, the starting point to this, and Harriet, if you could um, please go to the next slide, 
Sorry. is that we find most CP CPO powers in what we can refer to as enabling acts of parliament. So these acts will specify purposes for which um, compulsory acquisition is available, subject of course to the relevant tests, and who is authorized to acquire land in such a way. Um, I should add that all CPO powers also provide a power uh, to acquire land by agreement, uh, and this is something that requires exploration of every CPO, and um, Harriet mentioned the importance of that as well. Um, in the absence of an agreement, a statutory enabling power is required, and I will focus on the three most relevant or most commonly uh, this is not a statistical claim, but uh, very commonly used enabling powers, um, which are set out in the next slide. Thank you, Harriet. Um, so these are the enabling powers under the Town and Country Planning Act, under the Housing Act of 1985, and under the Highways Act. Um, starting with the Town and Country uh, Planning Act. Um, next slide, please. The key provision here is section 226. Uh, which authorizes local authorities to purchase land under a CPO if, and that is really the, the key requirement uh, one must be able to show, if the acquisition will facilitate the development, redevelopment or improvement of land or acqui acquisition is required to achieve the proper planning of an area. So as such, one of the following objects needs to be shown um, about the relevant local authorities area in conjunction with the CPO, and that is the promotion or improvement of the economic well-being of the area, and the same for um, the social well-being of the area and the environmental well-being of the area. Um, there are, of course, many examples um, at present um, of uh, redevelopment projects around the country. I've listed um, but one example here of a CPO made under section 226 of the 1990 Act, um, which is the redevelopment project um, uh, in Southwark uh, that incorporated 830 new homes. So uh, um, a project of considerable scale. Um, the, the project included many uh, affordable homes as part of that scheme uh, and also socially uh, rented housing and wheelchair accessible flats. Um, so that is just uh, one example, and you can find the relevant references online um, uh, as for the inspector's decisions um, and the Secretary of State's orders. Um, two other things that I wanted to mention about um, the, the, the power under Section 226 um, is the link between that power and the um, applicable DCLG guidance. So paragraph 66 of that guidance restricts the use of the general power um, by saying that the power should not be used in place of other more appropriate enabling powers. So there we have um, a reminder um, to, uh, that is being issued to, to again look very carefully uh, at what it is that you're actually seeking to achieve, what it is that you're trying to do with the CPO and to not rely on 226 um, if, if there is another power that could more suitably be used. Uh, it must also be stressed that paragraph 106 of the same guidance stipulates that um, where a CPO is promoted under, uh, under section 226, the Secretary of State will take uh, three other factors into account uh, when deciding whether to grant uh, CPO powers and that includes whether um, the purpose for which the land is being acquired fits in with the adopted planning framework for the area or core strategy, and also um, looking at the, uh, whether the financial viability of the scheme um, uh, can, be, can be shown. Um, moving on then to the Highways Act of 1980. Uh, thank you, Harriet. Um, I've set out the relevant sections here um, that have the uh, relevant enabling powers. The key test is whether the local highway authority um, wishes to purchase land through a CPO in order to either construct or improve a highway. And I've set out two examples here of what that might look like in practice. The first one um, is uh, one uh, from a uh, 2000 High Court decision uh, in Stanton, and it's a, it's a very typical one. So here, 
uh, this scheme uh, or this CPO rather considered a major road uh, that had been purchased by way of um, CPO due to it being in poor condition and having a high accident rate. Um, and essentially what had happened here is a, a cost benefit, benefit analysis had been carried out, which estimated that over a 30 day, 30 year, sorry, period uh, from the planned bypass opening, uh, in, excess, uh, in excess of 50 casualties would be saved by the proposal. Um, so that's a, that's a clear um, uh, sort of a very, very standard way of, of using CPO powers under the Highways Act. The second example is a more novel example, uh, but also an appropriate use um, of CPO powers under this legislation. Here, um, there was uh, uh, the CPO con concerned a field that was bought next to the M11 uh, with the view to facilitating the provision of a service station and other um, buildings as well. Uh, and at a later point in time, plan planning permission was granted uh, for the building of a hotel uh, on that site as well um, that would be used in connection with the use of the M11. Uh, and th that was being challenged. Um, and so it's, it's a it's an interesting case because the, the challenge was directly in relation to whether the hotel could be deemed a development that could be viewed as falling within the relevant purpose um, the CPO had been made for. And the upper tribunal said that it could because uh, it said that there was a direct link between um, the improvement um, of the highway. Um, next slide, please, Harriet. Thank you. So finally, we're looking at the Housing Act of 1985. Uh, here, Section 17 is the relevant enabling power. Um, it essentially empowers local housing, uh, housing authorities to acquire land, um, houses, uh, other properties by way of a CPO uh, for the provision of housing accommodation, uh, where the acquisition will achieve a quantitative or qualitative housing gain. Um, this power, um, many of you will be aware, is commonly used to purchase uh, unoccupied properties or properties uh, in poor condition. Obviously, it could be um, both things uh, occurring at the same time. Um, and I've set out a relevant uh, reference for that type of scenario here. Um, in this type of scenario, the applicability of the Housing Act um, CPO power is relatively straightforward and uncontroversial. Um, however, there is an obvious link between housing and regeneration. And it can be slightly trickier to decide um, whether the Housing Act or the Town and Country Planning Act is the appropriate framework. Um, I don't have a lot of time to go into uh, the details of how to make that call. However, um, there is some case law to assist us. And um, I've set out here the um, Mufasa um, decision. Um, in this case, the, uh, the claimant's case was that because the council's argument was that the existing housing stock was in disrepair. Uh, section, se section 17 would have enabled the purchases uh, in a more focused and selective way rather than the blanket procedure, as they put it, under Section 226 of the Town and Country Planning Act. Um, the inspector, however, uh, concurred with the council's view that the use of um, Housing Act powers would be too selective and uh, for a comprehensive redevelopment scheme uh, that entailed um, the redevelopment of uh, very many houses, um, uh, the, uh, the powers under the Town and Country Planning Act were deemed more appropriate. I have one final slide. Um, thank you, Harriet. So this is essentially just setting out, uh, I won't discuss any of these, but I thought it would be helpful to set out um, a few other commonly used enabling powers. Uh, and I also wanted to mention that, uh, just for the sake of completeness really, that for certain um, large scale projects, such as um, HS2, for example, um, CPO powers have been granted in special designated legislation. So there you wouldn't go to, the, um, to, to any of the, the powers that we have, um, that I've discussed throughout this talk, uh, but for certain um, large scale projects, um, there is a specific type of legislation that will have been passed um, to, to enable CPOs to be put in place. And, and that's it for me. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Christina.
over to Paul. Paul? Yes, I'm trying to start my video. Am I, am I, can I be seen? Unfortunately not. I think, I think visual is very important in cases of this kind. Well, I don't know. Try. In my case, but um, <laughs> uh, I'll try again. It says okay. unable to stop video, so you're going to have to hear me rather than see me. Um, so Pearls let's of just wisdom, go on. Pearls of wisdom. Just go on with the slides then. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, perhaps it's a good thing you can't see me, um, but um, uh, for those of you who are seasoned practitioners, um, um, you will be familiar with the notion of the scheme and that huge body of complex case law um, that has dogged uh, the, the, the law of compensation over many, many years, uh, and now to some extent codified uh, in amendments to the Land Compensation Act 1961. Now, for those of you who are new to this, I'm not going to overcomplicate this, so experienced practitioners, please bear with me. Um, the scheme uh, is the scheme of development that justifies the making of the CPO. And uh, this turns on the statutory power that is utilized by the acquiring authority, but it's to be determined as a matter of fact. And as I say on this slide, it's often a difficult question to determine. Uh, and I cannot overemphasize the importance of understanding the issue uh, because it's the scheme or the prospect of the scheme that's to be disregarded in assessing compensation. So a landowner claiming compensation after the land has been acquired, um, any uplift which is uh, ascribed to the scheme will be ignored, as will any diminution uh, in value which is attributable to the scheme. Uh, it's called the no scheme principle and it's been codified. Now, could I have the next slide please, Harriet? Right. Section 6A to 6E of the Act make provision for the assessment of value, applying the no scheme principle. And section 6A lists five no scheme rules that must be followed when applying the no scheme principle. So if we can move on again, please, Harriet. Let's look at the rules. It's to be assumed that the scheme was cancelled on the relevant valuation date. Two, it's to be assumed that no action has been taken, including acquisition of any land and any development or works by the acquiring authority wholly or mainly for the purposes of the scheme. Three, it's to be assumed that there is no prospect of the same scheme or any other project to meet the same or substantially the same need being carried out in the exercise of statutory function or by the exercise of CPO powers. Next slide, please. Rule four, it's to be assumed that no other projects would have been carried out in the exercise of a statutory function or by the exercise of compulsory purchase powers if the scheme had been cancelled on a relevant valuation date. Five, there was, if there was a reduction in value of land as a result of A, the prospect of the scheme, including before the scheme or the compulsory acquisition was authorised, or B, the fact that the land was blighted land as a result of the scheme, that reduction is to be disregarded. And importantly, section 6B provides that any increases in the value of the claimant's other land which is contiguous or adjacent to the land taken is deducted from the compensation payable. Forgive me for reading that all out. I, I, I'll explain the significance of this now. Next slide, please, Harriet. 
Okay. Now, the foregoing slides indicate those matters which, when considering the scheme, will bear upon the compensation which is ultimately payable. When you decide to make a CPO, you will do so by reference to all of those matters which have been uh, mentioned uh, by my colleagues earlier on. But also you will have regard to the prospective compensation that is payable because you will have to demonstrate at the CPO inquiry uh, that you will be in funds actually to acquire that land and to carry out the scheme. So it's important from that perspective. But it's also important to be able to define the scheme, one, to know what the compensation parameters might be, but also as a means of justifying the CPO, because uh, members or, or councils, when they come to make a decision whether or not to make a CPO, will have to consider the nature of the scheme and what it is a CPO is intended to facilitate. And secondly, uh, the statement of reasons, which you've heard about, must also contain a justification by reference to the scheme. So it's essential from the outset that you understand what the scheme is and what the extent of the scheme is. Now, section 6D defines the scheme. And um, forgive me for reading this out again, but it's important. For the purposes of section 6A, B and C, the scheme in relation to a, C, a compulsory acquisition means a scheme of development underlying the acquisition. Where the acquiring authority is authorized to acquire land in connection with the development of an area designated as an urban development area uh, or a new town or mayoral development area, the scheme will be defined um, of any land for the purposes for which the area is or was designated. Next slide, please, Harriet. Where land is acquired for regeneration or redevelopment, which is facilitated or made possible by a relevant transport project, i.e. a road or railway, for example, the scheme includes the relevant transport project. If there is a dispute as to what is to be taken to be the scheme, then for the purposes of the section, the underlying scheme is to be identified by the app tribunal as a question of fact. So, Assuming the CPO is confirmed on the basis of the scheme as it was articulated in the instrument making the CPO and the statement of reasons, it's still able, uh, it's, still, it's still possible for the scope of the scheme to be questioned when one comes to determine compensation. Now, the, the subject clauses are A, that the underlying scheme is to be taken to be the scheme provided for by the Act or other instrument which authorises a CPO, unless it's shown by the party that the underlying scheme is a scheme larger than, but incorporating a scheme provided for that instrument, and, next slide please, Harriet, Except by agreement or in special circumstances, the upper tribunal may permit the acquiring authority to advance evidence of such a larger scheme only if that larger scheme is one identified in the following read together. The instrument which authorises a compulsory acquisition and any documents made available with it. So it's essential that you get it right from the beginning because the latitude which will be afforded to an acquiring authority at later stages is extremely limited. It goes on, in the application of no scheme rule three in relation to the acquisition of land for or in connection with the construction of a highway, the reference in that rule to any other project includes a reference to any other highway that would meet the same or substantially the same need as a scheme highway would have been constructed to meet. Next slide, please, Harriet. So, as I say, it's important uh, to accurately describe uh, in the CPA documentation um, the scheme, and it should be drawn as widely as reasonably possible, having regard to the extent 
of the development that is to take place or which is being enabled by the acquisition and its purpose. Now, just to leave the slides now. When one comes to um, consider um, the effect of the scheme and of disregarding the scheme, the rule is simply that the scheme is disregarded for the purposes of assessing compensation. That disregard occurs on the relevant valuation date. Now, what is the extent of the disregard? And this is why the scheme is important. It relies upon not only the scheme, which underlies the acquisition, but also the policy support for that scheme that exists. So that could include, for example, specific policies in a development plan that are intended to facilitate the particular development, like a regeneration project. Do I have any more slides on, uh, under that one? No. No, it doesn't matter that's because the final slide. That, that's fine. Um, because the, the, the issue uh, is really to consider what development is facilitated by the CPO. Now I'm going to take two examples now. How are we doing for time? I'm nearly there. Um, I did uh, junction 7A of the M11 for um, Essex County Council. Um, now, ostensibly, uh, that CPO was, the justification for it was twofold. First of all, it was to relieve congestion south of Harlow because the only way into Harlow was from the south. But secondly, it was to facilitate allocations made in existing and emerging uh, local plan policies for the development of areas north of Harlow. So it was very, very important in that particular case um, that the scheme encompassed those two aspects so that any prospective ransom claim in terms of an uplift to open market value caused by any potential ransom inherent in the land uh, could be safely ignored. The scheme should not be restricted to a phase of a regeneration project. And I say that because if you're looking at a regeneration project, which is timed to last perhaps 15 years, and which may require um, further compuls compulsory purchase orders down the line where negotiations don't achieve a satisfactory outcome, it's important to ensure that each CPO is justified by reference to the scheme overall. Irrespective um, of the fact that that element of the scheme won't be coming online for a long time and that the instant acquisitions are required to complete, say, for example, the first phase only. So it's very important to maintain a focus on what that scheme is. So when you come uh, to consider making a CPO, the consideration of the scheme is extraordinarily important. And I think that's where I leave it, Harriet. Thank you very much. Thank you, um, Paul, um, ver very much for that. I, th I think, um, may I invite you to um, sum up um, according to this slide, drawing a bullet from each of the four of our talks. Absolutely. Um, now, this has only been an overview. We can't achieve a great deal more in an hour. Uh, we've covered actually quite a lot of ground in that time. And I hope for those who are new to the subject, they will have now a decent foundation and a framework within which to understand process. Believe you me, the process is extremely complex and the principles which govern compensation, which is uh, a subject which I expect we will cover in the future, is also extremely complex.
politics. Um, it emphasizes the need wherever possible to negotiate your way through. That may not, however, always be possible because even if you can agree a price with a landowner, you may still need a CPO in order to overcome any rights or other interests in the land which could inhibit development. So one needs to be aware of that. Choosing the power that most precisely fits your purpose. So many authorities in the past have gone wrong on this, particularly where it comes to 226 powers. Be very, very careful. Otherwise you might find yourself having to restart and it's very embarrassing. As I say, describe the scheme accurately and by reference to the relevant development plan policies where they, they are bespoke to um, the uh, development in question. So I hope um, that um, uh, has, has dealt with the subject uh, as comprehensively as comprehensively as we can in a short period of time we've had. Um, I'm not sure if we have any, any questions. I'm just about to have a look. Uh, no, there are no questions. Uh, it, now is your last chance to ask a question if you wish, and we'll try to answer it. Um, but uh, if that is not the case, then can I thank you sure. very much. <laughs> Sorry, Harriet. I was just inviting our, our many attendees who are remain very welcome and have, have um, uh, uh, sort of followed the um, followed the whole webinar not to hold back and to ask a question and perhaps if if too shy to, or too technically unable they wouldn't admit this to use the Q&A as I was until today um, perhaps they'd drop us an email um, if if we can help on any of the issues. That's absolutely fine of course absolutely. So uh, to everyone, um, my, my fellow contributors, thank you very much. And also uh, to you participants, um, we are grateful for your attendance and hope to see you again. Thank you very much. Thanks, Paul. Goodbye from me. Goodbye from Emmeline. Goodbye from Christina and goodbye from Paul. Oh, we now have two. Paul, are you still there? Ah, yes. Ah, we, we have a couple of questions I'm so pleased to see um, from Sonia Sharp. Uh, is there one case which is the best summary of the key issues? Um, and we've had a thank you very much from Michelle Hogue. Thank you. Thank you to Michelle. Um, that is a, a um, very good question. Uh, Sonia, and I'm going to pass it to Paul, or perhaps perhaps I might take it on notice and send you an email. Paul, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, I mean, um, it, it depends what you mean by key issues. Um, procedurally, um, there will be a good number of cases um, that deal with procedural errors, uh, for, for example, in relation to notices and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So it, it's quite complex. Uh, there isn't one particular case that sums that up. Uh, so far as um, the scheme and Point Gordon and, and, and compensation issues, um, the case law um, is immense, absolutely immense. Um, Paul, and would you agree, my favourite case is one in which Anthony Porton QC, who was a member of our chambers, was closely involved, the Waters case, which went to the House of Lords. Yeah. Although it's now somewhat out of date because of the legislation you referred to, it, it is a case in which um, the House of Lords made it clear that the legislation was uh, uh, not fit for purpose and has led to some of those changes which have, have better rationalized the world of compensation. Would, would that be fair? Yeah, but but, but that certainly is a compensation case, and it, it, you're right to raise that, a very important case. Mm. Um, despite the fact we've got codification, it's unlikely actually that these challenges uh, are, are going to subside. I, I think uh, applying the rules and, and the new provisions is still going to result in challenges down the line uh, as a means of um, challenging the lawfulness of decisions by the upper tribunal when it comes to defining the scheme. 
So we haven't seen the end of it by any means. So Sonia, sorry to say there is not one case, but we can consider whether there are a few cases that provide you in, in procedural terms, uh, provide you with the kind of pointers uh, you want. Thank you, Paul. And thank you, Sonia, for your question. Uh, absolutely, the webinar sl slides uh, will be distributed, they will be posted on our website. If you would like to set us to send you a copy direct, please email Chambers. We're very happy to do that. Um, and um, J Das acts, what effect is the Equalities Act having on CPO confirmations? Uh, oh, it's, it's increasingly important in the justification of a CPO. It is having a major effect in, in my view, even though the 2010 Act uh, really reenacts principles that have been in place since 1995, it does receive greater prominence now than before. Um, and any further questions on that perhaps um, to follow. There, I hope we have um, covered everything and um, and that you enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you all very much indeed. I'm going to close the webinar now. Although how I have yet to...